Okay, let's do case number nine. And um, okay, tough case. Maybe you guys have seen this. This is a patient who immediately, uh, after resection of a frontal meningioma, is having trouble awakening from anesthesia. And these were done, you know, two or three hours after the surgery. On your left, you see a non-gadolinium T1 weighted image, and on your left, uh, you see a gradient echo T2 weighted image. The patient has a little bit of edema here from the uh, surgery on this area. Give you a couple of seconds to look at the findings. Uh, pattern recognition too. Okay, should we go on to the first question? Okay, here it is. The diagnosis is A amyloid related bleeds, B, hemorrhages due to inadvertent trauma, C, remote cerebellar hemorrhages, D, hypertensive cerebellar bleeds, and E, transverse sinus thrombosis with cerebellar infarctions. So there are two things there that could be, but one of them is, fits the diagnosis, fits the imaging findings quite well. So let's see what you guys are going to do with this case, and the majority of you said uh, thrombosis of the venous sinus, and the correct answer is C, and that was 25%. The findings are typical for the so-called uh, remote cerebral hemorrhages, and in uh, Ann Osborne's new book, she has some beautiful cases, and they've also been described extensively in the literature. Unfortunately, not as much in our literature as in the uh, neurosurgical literature, but there's also a nice article uh, from the group in Salt Lake City earlier this year in the AJNR. So let's take a look at the second question. Which one is false regarding remote cerebellar bleeds? A, they may be related to venous infarctions. B, they may be associated with aspirin. C, they may be associated with hypertension. D, they may be related to arterial infarctions. And E, they may be associated with CSF hypovolemia. Which one is false? answer is uh, D, arterial infarction. So it's pretty well distributed. All of the other findings can uh, lead uh, to remote uh, cerebellar bleeds, and we're going to talk about those in a second here. So this is taken from that article that I mentioned earlier this year in the AJNR. So let's take a look at what these are, because you will see them, and you will see them in certain tests uh, too. So uh, there are uh, cerebral bleeds after supratentorial surgery, although the opposite may happen too. You can have infratentorial surgery and have a cerebral hemispheric hematoma. They are rare. They occur in about 1% or less than 1% of all surgeries, probably much less than 1%. They are self-limiting and they have a good prognosis. They are particularly uh, common after frontal or frontal temporal craniotomies for some reason uh, that nobody knows. The symptoms may be none. The patients may be completely asymptomatic or may demonstrate motor uh, deficits. They may have ataxia, and like in this patient, they dem may demonstrate prolonged awakening from anesthesia. The causes are believed to be a hypovolemia that leads to a sagging cerebellum. This leads, uh, this leads to stretching of the uh, veins on the surface of the cerebellum and a transient occlusion of the veins and then um, in a uh, hemorrhagic infarction. And as I said before, uh, if the patient has hypertension or if the patient has been treated with aspirin or is in, uh, treated while, while he's undergoing surgery with aspirin, this may uh, increase the risk of uh, bleeds uh, for uh, remote cerebral bleeds.